So this is what we want to spend time on in, in this first part of our presentation this evening. What is a change agent? A change agent is someone who communicates and diffuses an innovation. And given Paul's approach and his presumptions, namely if you look at his letters, he presumes that the recipients of these letters knew Israel's story. What would non-Israelites care about Israel's story going all the way back to Abraham? What would they know of it? And he presumed that some knew Israel scripture and that his essential task, Paul's essential task was to proclaim how the God of Israel was revealed in the resurrection of Jesus, thus appointing Jesus, Israel's Messiah, with the forthcoming Israelite theocracy. That's Paul's understanding, self-understanding. All of this should make it quite clear to you that Paul's message was meant for Israelites and only for Israelites. And given the range of Israelites in the first century, the perception both of the message and of approaches to the message would follow the patterns of the recipients of this innovation spread by Paul, a change agent in Israel. Perhaps what I need to emphasize there is the range of Israelites. All contemporary Jewish scholars will tell you that they are uncomfortable using the word Judaism for the first century. They would prefer that you spoke of Judaisms. Remember what I said to you yesterday, where there are two Israelites, there are three opinions. Well, in the first century, many people say, how come people didn't know that, or ask, how come people didn't know that Jesus was the Messiah? Which one? Messiah was like Heinz 57 variety. There was another one every day, maybe another 10 every day, each proclaiming some different kind of aspect. How were you supposed to decide? In the first century, there was no uniform expectation of who a Messiah would be, where this Messiah would come from, and what this Messiah would do. So to say I'm a Messiah is to say nothing, is to leave people confused. It's not very clear. So given this understanding, now we need to take a look at Paul as a change agent. So what does that mean, a change agent? Can someone introducing a change? First point is, a change agent is usually sent by one group to communicate with another group. Totally on a human level, right? So one group has an idea for innovation. They select someone as a messenger to go and communicate this to another group. In the New Testament story, authorized change agents include the 12 sent by Jesus. Since he established this group, he then gave them the changes he wanted to diffuse. And, and Matthew 10 is a good example or a good a report of how Jesus sends this group as change agents. They're supposed to preach change. And then change agents are also those sent by a Jesus group agency such as the 12 in Jerusalem. So when you get to Acts of the Apostles, the 12 then are sending people out. Barnabas and Paul, you go here, you go there, you do this and you do this. So it's another group sending out such preachers, change agents to other areas. And Israelite scribes, also sent by some Pharisee group. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 7, there's a similar situation. That might be the clearest. When the Pharisees gathered together to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, those scribes who came from Jerusalem were sent by Jerusalem scribes. They were representative of that group. They would be change agents to find out what kind of new changes are being involved here. And as you know the story in Mark's Gospel, chapter 7, what Jesus' disciples are doing is eating without properly washing their hands and so on. So they're suspecting a change is being introduced and they're wondering who's creating this change, what the reason is and so on. Point is uh, that try to think in terms of these people not as ministers, I know we like this word and is badly used in our contemporary world, but as change agents. These are people working changes. So the difference about Paul was that he was commissioned directly by God. No group sent Paul. And in Galatians, you see that very clearly, right? You remember the very beginning of Galatians. Paul, an apostle, right at the beginning. Not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus, Messiah, and God the Father. So right at the very beginning, he says, I am an apostle, and how did I get to be this way? The 12 didn't commission me. I'm not from any human agency, but God personally commissioned me. So he was commissioned directly, just like Jesus, and John the Baptist. Take a look at Mark 11, 27. And they came to Jerusalem, Jesus and his group. And as he, Jesus, was walking in the temple, the chief priests, if they are chief priests, they're gonna be lesser priests, right? 
Oh, these are elites. And the scribes, who are scribes, people who can read and write. That's approximately one to two percent of the population. That's also elite. These are high status people. And the elders, well, on the basis of life expectancy that we talked about yesterday, how many people could be elders? Well, not very many. So this is a very elite, small group. Well, they are the ones who empower and, and assign people to make change. And so they ask them, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? We didn't, and we're the ones who are supposed to do this. We never deputized you, we never empowered you. And the word authority, by the way, in Greek is exousia. And that's the word generally used when Jesus is working mighty deeds. Where'd you get this mighty power from? Notice that no one ever denies anything he did. They all accept the reality, it really happened. They don't debate about whether it happened or not. The debate is always, on whose authority did this happen? Who gave you power to do this? And has to do with, so Jesus making changes, who empowered you to make these changes? To continue, let me not interrupt that story. So what does Jesus say to them in response? So let me ask you a question, since you posed me this question. Let me ask you about the baptism that John is giving. Where did that come from? John's baptism. Did John make it up? Or did John do it on some divine empowerment? And then they realized they were stuck. If they said it's from human sources, people would be against them because everybody believed that John was approved by God. And if they said it's from God, then Jesus would say, so why don't you accept it? What are you arguing about it for? So what this passage tells us is that John and Jesus and Paul were directly commissioned by God, directly informed by God to initiate these changes. Thus, the God of Israel is behind Jesus and Paul. What's the novelty or the innovation? The innovation that Jesus proclaimed, his good news, is that there is a forthcoming Israelite theocracy, which in the New Testament is always proclaimed as kingdom of God. Kingdom of God or reign of God in Matthew. That's Jesus' basic message. God is going to reign as God was supposed to have through the kings of old, but that didn't work out. This is what's coming. Paul's novelty is, Paul's innovation is, that the God of Israel raised Jesus from the dead and thus revealed Jesus to be Israel's Messiah and cosmic Lord with a view to the forthcoming Israelite theocracy. So you see the difference. Jesus simply said there's a theocracy coming after the resurrection. Paul's insight from God was, that Jesus is the one who is going to be leading this theocracy will establish it. All right.